Hi everyone, I'm Mandy Medley. I'm one of the co-owners of the new iteration of Pilsen Community Books, which is a worker cooperative in the beloved Pilsen neighborhood of Chicago. And I am so, so, so excited that you guys are joining us here tonight at the intersection of art and activism to celebrate Susan Briante's wonderful Defacing the Monument. It's out this week from Noemi Press. And I'm excited to hear a bit about the important work of Kino Border Initiative as well. I am so thrilled that Susan, Anthony, and Christina, and Joanna could all be here tonight. This is a huge deal for me and for Pilsen, and it's such a joy to have them all here in this virtual space. And if you don't yet have a copy of Defacing the Monument, you can order it from the Pilsen Community Books website. That's www.pilsencommunitybooks.com, or directly from Noemi at um, noemipress.org. Susan is donating at least 50% of the royalties from this book to Kino Border Initiative, and Noemi will be donating $5 for every book purchased tonight to Kino as well. So now is the time to get it if you want it. Um, and we'll be hearing a lot more about Kino Border Initiative later, but I did want to mention right now that you can um, visit them online at kinobordernitiative.org. A quick note about how this evening will go. First, Anthony, Christina, and Susan will each read a bit from their work or from Susan's work, and then Joanna will share a bit about Kino Border Initiative. And afterwards, we'll have time for a short Q&A, so if you have questions for any of the readers or presenters tonight, you can pop them in the YouTube chat, and we'll get to as many as we can. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first reader, the wonderful Anthony Cody. Anthony Cody is the author of Borderland Apocrypha, out from Omnidon in April of this year and winner of the 2018 Omnidon Open Book Prize. He is a Canto Mundo Fellow from Fresno, California. His poetry has appeared in Gulf Coast, Ninth Letter, Prairie Schooner, and Tri-Quarterly, among other journals. Anthony co-edited How Do I Begin, Among American Literary Anthology, out from Heyday in 2011. He manages social media for Canto Mundo, is an associate poetry editor for Noemi Press, and is a recent MFA creative writing graduate at Fresno State where he helps to support the Juan Felipe Herrera Laureate Lab Visual Wordist Studio. You can find more information about Anthony at www.anthonycody.com. And take it away, Anthony. Thank you so much. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that today I'm reading on the traditional lands of the Yokut and Mono peoples. I pay my respect to my native elders, both past and present, and to this land. May each of us present today continue to honor the true stewards of these lands and the lands themselves. I'm grateful to be here today in the presence of you all virtually. I'm super grateful for Susan for allowing me to uh, join you. And what, um, but what I want to start with is actually a little bit from her book. Um, because I recently read it and I had burned through it, I told her and several hours and several days and my own work kind of intersects with a very specific docu-poetics around the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and then the subsequent Mexican lynchings and Mexican-American lynchings that have happened since. This is from the opening section of Defacing the Monument. Investigative or documentary poetry or prose can be a space to record, to unearth, to help understand events as part of a larger systems and legacies. But as poets and documentarians, we should not fetishize the document. In isolation, it is meaningless, a blank slate upon which any story can be written. See WikiLeaks or Vanessa Place. The first step in extending the document might be to discern its limits and to situate it against other points of reference that expand its narrative, reveal its origins, and complicate its meaning. Ruckheiser knew this. Sometimes we need to deface the monument documents to write back through them or into them, to fill in what's been left out or suppressed, to break a cage of words or reveal a cage of words in order to speak some version of a truth. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to uh, share my screen for a bit uh, to share some of the poems that are um, visual in nature and then I'll close out um, with a little, with a one more poem um, and go from there. So bear with me while I change the screen. This Uh, 
this name that Oh my Hey, Anthony, I don't want to interrupt, but I think your audio is breaking up a little bit on this end. Yeah. I don't think we can hear you. Um, would you mind unsharing your screen and trying it? 
again? There again. Oh, now we can hear you now that you've unshared. You just read. Okay. Make that the easier. Is I that, think that that really better now. Yes. Okay. Perfect. That's right. totally fine. Okay. <clears throat> Um, about 70 men were killed, some of them in this, on this tree, before the war was halted by Texas Rangers. State Historical Survey Committee, Texas marker near the tree. So I'm gonna, so these are the last five TripAdvisor reviews of Goliad's Hanging Tree as of June 23rd, 2018. <clears throat> Title, Love Old Courthouses. Review, this hanging tree was just a bonus on the courthouse square, and the history that took place there was moving. Title, Spooky when you think of the tree's use. Review. One of the sites in Goliad is the hanging tree, a beautiful tree which was used to mete out justice after trials. Title, Beauty of a Tree. Review. Well, the name sort of says it all, but this is a beautiful tree. The courthouse is a class Texas courthouse, so the day was great. Title, Interesting in a gruesome kind of way. Review. This is a huge oak tree outside of the courthouse in Goliad. You really can picture the sentences being carried out. Title, Huge Oak Tree. The tree is located in the center of town, the grounds of the county courthouse. The tree has quite the history. When convicted, the prisoner was walked outside and hanged from this magnificent oak tree. Talk to the oak tree. Ask the city to tear you down. City fortifies with stone. Ask to go into hiding. State erects metal plaque. Ask tourists to leave, and they test your strength to hold their weight. Ask them if they notice your shadows shaped in a mass burial of twitching legs. Let them memory. El Arbol number 10 is a series of narrowing translations. El que bien arbol se arima, buena sombra le cobija. He who nears a good tree is blanketed by good shade. The one that comes to a good tree, good shadow blankets them. To near the tree, receive the blanket of shadow. To near the tree is to blanket yourself in darkness. So the last poem I'm going to read begins with an epitaph from Jeff Sessions, the former Attorney General, which he shared with the National Sheriff's Association on February 12, 2018. The office of sheriff is a critical part of the Anglo-American heritage of law enforcement. We must never erode this historic office. One, the inheritance of the air is never a dandelion dispersal, scattershot floating beyond fences growing elsewhere. Two, the inheritance of the air is a cave of collapse. Three, the cave of collapse is work. Four, the work is never inheritance of the heirs of the heirs' air, as well as the heirs' heirs' air. Five, the inheritance of repetition is a soundless gavel buried in a shallow grave. Six. The shallow grave is the redness of the bouquet of flora selects. Seven. The bouquet is cleaning into the quiet of a, is leaning into the quiet of a funeral. Eight. The quiet of a funeral is the Americas. Nine. The Americas is a platform built by settlers, sheriffs, miners for the lynching of the other. The lynching, 10, the lynching is a, vin, a vigilance committee of NAFTA, Operation Wetback, Maquiladoras, ICE, Silences, the Agricultural Prison, Industrial Complex, Congressmen, and U.S. Presidents. 11, the silences is gerrymandering the census data. 12, the census data is learning about the, work incarcer the word incarceration through the storytelling project playing on public radio. 13, the incarceration is an ombligo of shirts in a forest of screams. 14. The ombligo is feeding again and never hungry. 15. The feeding is a church of excommunications inside a cage of teeth. 16. The cage of teeth is elected into office. 17. The elected are voting to eliminate whatever and everything. 18. The voting are no longer asking permission. 19. The permission is trafficking. 20. The trafficking is now asked to self-report. 21. The self-report is now asked to fill out a binary form in ink on the line. 22, the binary is seeking a fourth option during the election. 23, the election is a wall. 24, the wall is a type of silence. 25, the silence is a type of America. 
26, the type of America is in the arrest. 27, the arrest is defined as cessation or stoppage of motion. 28, the cessation or stoppage of motion is the fabric veiling the artifice. 29, the fabric veiling the artifice is the factory of harps. 30, the factory of harps is a maker of a stringless harp. 31, the stringless harp is the mute progeny. 32, the mute progeny is now the inheritance of the heir. Thank you so much, and congratulations, Susan, on such a beautiful book. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was lovely. Um, and we did get to see some of the visuals when you shared the screen earlier, and many people in the chat were, they were very excited. So thank you for sharing. Um, up next, I'm excited to hear from Christina. Christina Rivera Garza is the award-winning author of six novels, three collections of short stories, five collections of poetry, and three nonfiction books. Originally written in Spanish, these works have been translated into multiple languages, including English, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Korean. The recipient of the Roger Caillois Award for Latin American Literature, as well as the Ana Zagueres, she is the only author who has won the International Sor Juana y de la Cruz Prize twice. She has translated from English into Spanish, Notes on Conceptualisms by Vanessa Place and Robert Fitterman, and from Spanish into English, Nine Mexican Poets edited by Cristina Rivera Garza in New American Writing 31. She is a distinguished professor in Hispanic Studies and director of the Creative Writing Program at the University of Houston. Now I've handed over to you, Cristina. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I think you might be muted. Now, I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited and very grateful to be here, Susan. That was wonderful. Anthony, thank you so much for your work, too. And um, I, I was so moved by the face in the monument. It's so thought-provoking. It speaks so directly to our present. It's, uh, as, I, as I've been saying to pretty much everybody, this is such an urgent book. And I, I recommend, recommend it, like really, everybody should be reading that. And for today, I, um, I was uh, going through your book again, and I, um, I was looking, I was reading specifically that part in which you speak about uh, your grandmother. And that, that was something that specifically spoke to me. I, I've been writing a book about uh, the migration history of my grandparents uh, in a book whose title is uh, in Spanish, Autobiografía del Algodón, Autobiography of Cotton. And so I decided to share with you a, a, a brief section of that book uh, in, um, in Spanish. That section's title is... Um, Breve eh, Arqueología Doméstica de la Repatriación. In English, it is a brief domestic archaeology of deportation. So I'm trying to cover both the push and pull factors of my family being pushed out of the United States in, in the late mid 1930s and finding uh, a new home. Uh, in the other side of the border, uh, close to Matamoros, Tamaulipas, around that time. So this domestic archaeology is uh, essentially, I'm, I'm going through some of the objects that my family has talked about a lot, the kinds of things that they brought over from the United States into Mexico, and that in many ways uh, mark them as someone, as people who came from over there, el otro lado. And so I'm just going to read a couple of those sections and then a final paragraph. And, uh, and again, thank you for having me here. According to the list of tax-free objects, which a group of 2,100 immigrants returning from the United States introduced into Mexico in 1927, specifically in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, the following items, among other things, arrived. 10 plows, 24 automobiles, 12 tires, 52 chickens, 16 pillows, 60 sets of sheets, 95 beds, 106 mattresses, 42 sewing machines, 10 mirrors, 3 typewriters, a box of books, and not even one woman's hat. 
Permit 202, authorized by the State Department, was issued on December 14th of the same year. It is always difficult to decide what to bring when you prepare for a trip, especially a long journey. Faced with a pile of objects that taste uh, or necessity and emotional attachment have been selecting over the years, what do you bring with you on a journey where there is no return, where things will remain behind, now out of place, orphans even to themselves, and which will go with you, ready to acclimate to a new context. While I observe the objects in my house, identifying things that have survived only one move, and those that have already moved three or four times with me, a bird crashes against the window. We're not talking about a trip in the modern sense of the word, visiting or tourism, moving from one place to another, being transported. You have to call things by their name. This is expulsion. This is deportation. What do you choose when, as the poet Tarifa Faisula said, one finds out one day that you can't earn back your own country? There is a first day you learn to kill yourself without dying. Your own country demands it. It isn't news. It isn't you. It is news. Face with movable and stationary goods, face with the perishable and the perpetual, face with minutia and with the indispensable, there must be a sense of loss, accompanied discreetly by a clamoring for return. But return to what? To a country that perhaps you can earn back this time, to a place that doesn't force yourself, to a place that doesn't force you to learn to kill yourself. Furniture. It has always struck me as strange that in my family, they call cars furniture. I don't know if other border dwellers do this, but among my aunts and grandfathers who participated in the social and agricultural cotton experiment beginning in 1937 in Anahuac, Tamaulipas, they all agreed, correctly for sure, that any possession involving movement had to be called furniture, vis-a-vis -vis buildings as immovable goods. Perhaps the distinction echoes Cherokee artist Jimmy, Durham idea, Jimmy Durham's ideas about the radical political differences between building and furniture, between a rock and a hard place. Perhaps my grandparents harbored the same mistress of architecture and invention of the states, according to Durham, and, uh, and even the, of chairs, the enemies of nomadism. The furniture in which they crossed the border was a Ford, similar to the 20 that had arrived in Matamoros at the end of 1927, which helped them to travel the miles that separated Laredo from Monterrey, and then from Monterrey to Estación Rodríguez and Estación Camarón. Moths against the windshield, butterflies, wasps. Soon they exchanged this furniture for another, a flag green pickup truck with metal box border with thick flat bars, which made it easier to transport tools and heavier loads. Padded seats, wooden steering wheel. Cristino, my grandfather, smoked those unfiltered cigarettes with, to with dark tobacco, which left yellow stains between forefinger and middle finger on his right hand. The music of unspoken words, the hum of the engine. Tent. Made of six and a half by ten foot walls raised with the help of oak and mosquito wooden poles, a foldable tent is an ephemeral construction, but it is still a construction, soft architecture, the structure that momentarily holds those who flee, those who do not cease fleeing. That's what the newlyweds, my grandparents, carried with them upon crossing the border made of a light and waterproof material, the color of army green. Their home was a type of architecture favored by nomads or exiles. Michael Lloyd, an architect working for the United Nations with homeless people and refugees, once said that humans don't require much in terms of shelter. People, he said, feel a greater need for the things to have shelter, 
possessions serve to preserve a sense of self, especially in times when the world is violently trying to terminate this. The tent served as a home near irrigation system number four and also protected them from storms when they undertook a longer journey instead of going directly to the north of Tamaulipas with a caravan that had obtained lands on the border thanks to the agrarian reform. The lack of knowledge about the territory or plain misfortune made them follow the road towards the south, towards the field of San Fernando, where for a couple of years they tried to grow corn, beans, cotton without any luck. Soon they were again on the move, returning to the border. A gigantic zipper took the place of a door in that mobile house, which served them as a protection from uh, inclement weather and the non-intimacy of being with others. I thought that I was arriving in Houston for the first time, but I was wrong. In 1990, when I got off of an America uh, out of Mexico plane to start a journey that has already lasted, lasted about 30 years, I was actually returning to Houston. In the instant of a generation, my arrival to Houston at the end of the 20th century would seem a more or less pragmatic individual decision. It was not. I was itching to leave, that's true, itching to start all over again in a new place. Little did I know then that this, the longest of journeys, was less a personal decision and more a family tradition. Little did I know that in the long durée of my own history, this migration emulated so many others, begun decades if not centuries before. A return to the border, an attachment to the border. Little did I know that what I had become accustomed to defining as an, an adventure was also an expulsion. To know no nation will be home until one does, says Solmaz Sharif, and it is true. You only begin to ask questions when not asking them implies a deadly risk. One day, they asked me how many years had I been living in this country, and I answer immediately, five or six or 13. It was a ridiculous number. The number didn't fit with the history of my university years, not the, not the stories of my first jobs in the North or the first marriages. Obsessions are obsessions because you can't see them. White lies, too. It wasn't until my uh, friend pointed out my error, it should be longer, don't you think, that I began to remember. And then, like someone who comes up from the bottom of a river almost completely out of breath, ready to swallow the oxygen with an open mouth and teeth ready to bite to live, I began to ask. My grandparents gave me this country, less of a gift and more of an amulet, less of a commitment and more of a promise. Maybe a disappointment. Every time I drive down Navigation Street in Houston, I think about the hands, the back, and the smile of my grandfather, Cristino Beltis, this street. My aunt still whispers from her, ho uh, from her house. Those trees, the clouds in the distance, the air we breathe to be alive. And then I remember, as if I never really would have known it before, that my name is the feminine version of his. The Canadian poet Anne Michaels has said that the real question about your origin is not where you were born, but rather what earth will clothe your bones. No one can answer that question in the first person singular. The, to answer that question, she too said, requires the participation of others. Only the land can answer that question with complete honesty. And so, one day, one of these days, you realize, like others did before, that there is no way you can earn your own country. Not right now, and not here. Thank you. Congratulations again, Susan. Oh, Christina, that was lovely. Thank you so much. 
Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, the person of the evening, Susan. We're all here to celebrate her book. Um, Susan Briante's book, The Market Wonders, a Sada Press, was a finalist for the National Poetry Series. The Canyon Review calls it masterful at every turn. She is also the author of Poetry Collections, Pioneers in the Study of Motion, and Utopia Minus, which was an Academy, American Poets, Academy of American Poets notable book of 2011, both from Asada Press. And, of course, her newest book, which we are here to celebrate tonight, Defacing the Monument. Brianti has received grants and awards from the Atlantic Monthly, the McDowell Colony, the Academy of American Poets, the Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Memorial Fund, and the U.S.-Mexico Fund for Culture. She is Professor of Creative Writing and Literature at the University of Arizona. Now, Susan, I'll give it to you. If you want to share your screen, um, I'm going to try and do split screen, so hopefully the sound will work, but I'll let you know. Okay. I'm going to, um, I am going to try the share screen. Let's get crazy. Um, so how... Uh, I, I can't hear you. Okay, now can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mandy, you can hear me? Okay. So we will, I won't share, which, um, which is okay. It just means that you'll need to buy or borrow the book from someone who has to see the beautiful things that are inside. I want to thank, um, oh my goodness, Anthony and Christina, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful words with us and um, being part of this evening. It means so much to me. I admire your work as writers so much. And Joanna, thank you so much. I admire your work on the border. Thank you so much for joining me tonight and for working with me these past few years on and off. Um, as part of the Field Studies and Writing Project, which is one of the projects that sort of inspired this this book. Um, I also want to thank Mandy for being a fantastic host. I, I want to thank Carmen Jimenez-Smith and Susie Garcia and Sarah Zemsky at Noeme Press for helping me to make this book the best book that it could be. And um, I also want to thank Doug Kearney, who was the designer for this book, who really made through his vision, made the archive kind of come to life um, within its pages. The My selection is going to jump around a little bit, and um, Christina, I'm going to talk a little bit about my great-grandmother, so I'm glad you, you mentioned her. But we're going to start the reading at the um, operation, at an Operation Streamline hearing, which probably many of you already know this, but Operation Streamline is the process through which um, up to and quite often 75 migrants at a time are brought before a judge and sentenced in mass to the crime of illegal entry. And, and it takes place in various places around the country, but um, we have Operation Streamline hearings right here in Tucson, Arizona. And the sections I'm gonna read will end up um, in Nogales, Mexico, in some of the sites where the Kino Border Initiative uh, provided aid for migrants. In the U.S. District Court, District of Arizona, I sit in the back of the courtroom, scribbling on a legal pad, trying to trace a relation to the seven men who stand before the judge, shackled at the wrists, waists, and ankles. The body is a condition, the nation another. I used to believe the document tethered the poem to the earth, to soil that one could taste, that could be nutrient to more than one, but a document can pull a nation out from under you. Seven men approach the bench. One by one, they speak directly into the microphone to become a name in a document, a few words in the record, and one syllable of consent. Do you understand the rights that you are giving up, the consequences of pleading guilty, and the terms of your written plea agreement? Are you pleading guilty voluntarily and of your own free will? Are you a citizen of the United States? 
On or about March 17, 2017, did you enter the United States from Mexico near Nogales without coming through a designated port of entry? How do you plead to the charge of illegal entry? Do you understand the rights that you were giving up, the consequences of pleading guilty in the terms of your written plea agreement? Are you pleading guilty voluntarily and of your own free will? Are you a citizen of the United States? On or about March 18th, 2017, did you enter the United States from Mexico near Lukeville without coming through a designated port of entry? How do you plead to the charge of illegal entry? Do you understand the rights that you are giving up, the consequences of pleading guilty in the terms of your written plea agreement? Are you pleading guilty voluntarily and of your own free will? Are you a citizen of the United States? On or about March 14th, 2017, did you enter the United States from Mexico near Sasabi without coming through a designated port of entry? How do you plead to the charge of illegal entry? If a line is a dot that went for a walk, then a wall is a line that divides Nogales, Arizona from Nogales, Sonora. A deportee is a man who left his kids at a bus stop was pulled over by the cops, could not produce a social security number, and was sent first to jail, then to Nogales, Sonora, to be handed his belongings in a large Ziploc bag from the Department of Homeland Security. A frame of words can determine what one sees. A man walks across the U.S. border along a partitioned walkway. A man walks across the U.S. border in a caged walkway. U.S. officials escort a man across the U.S.-Mexico border in a human cage. And if I refer to him as a father of two, and if I refer to him as a man, and if I refer to him as a refugee, and if I refer to him as a migrant, and if I refer to him as undocumented, and if I refer to him as a defendant, and if I refer to him as illegal, and if I refer to him as criminal, metaphors make of I Venn gram of contrast and resemblance. Who goes where? In a safe, in our bedroom closet, in our bank owned house, 72 miles from the US Mexico border, on the traditional lands of the Tohono O'odham Nation, my husband, Fareed, keeps his naturalization certificate a newspaper clipping of his naturalization ceremony, and a letter from then-President Bill Clinton. On my laptop, I open a scan of my great-grandmother's enemy alien identification card. Issued in 1942, when she had been living in the United States for 37 years, the U.S. government required the card be carried by Italian-born immigrants, classified as enemy aliens during World War II as part of a series of measures that included travel restrictions, the seizure of personal property and internment. My great grandmother signs her name on the card with an X beneath which are written the words, her mark, and then witnessed by, and the name and address of her son. Because of her illiteracy and the war with fascist Italy, she could be deported under the current president's immigration policy, but she was not. And although I live on occupied lands, nobody asks me for my papers. From my great-grandmother's illiteracy to my place in the middle class might seem a story of American opportunity, where generations appear like stepping stones towards some goal of a mortgage and a 401k. But the documents do not make evident the structures of white supremacy and limited economic expansion that made progress possible. What rights my ancestors' luck and effort and assimilation have afforded me. Metaphors make circles of our histories, a Venn diagram of contrast and resemblance. I do not want my family's story to be a frame bent to resemble a human cage. On the U.S. side of the Nogales border, an unmarked white van parks just near the Deconcini border crossing. It is summer 2017. 
and Mexican officials in brown uniforms greet the deportees who step out of the van carrying large plastic evidence bags from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security containing whatever they had on them when the Border Patrol or ICE agents wrenched them from their lives in the Arizona desert or on the streets of Denver or San Francisco. In Nogales, Sonora, at the Migrant Aid Center, or Comedor, volunteers from the Kino Border Initiative provide free family-style meals to the men and women wanting to cross, or who have crossed and been deported here. They show a video from the Mexican Human Rights Commission. You have a right to work, the man in a broad cowboy hat from the video tells them. You have the right to be with your family. After the video, a nun tells the men to avoid the Nogales hotels, to avoid taking taxis, to stay at the shelter, to never borrow a phone from a stranger. Volunteers from the migrant rights group No More Deaths help the migrants cash the checks they received for the amount of money they carried in cash at the time of their arrest or apprehension. And the carceral system makes money from their money. A volunteer allows the migrants to use a phone to contact relatives. There are clothes in the bathroom. There is a volunteer medic to provide first aid. Black pins dot a desert map on the wall of the Comedor to show where the bodies of migrants had been found. More than 3,000 human remains have been found in the Sonoran Desert, most of them migrants. A man tells me, we just want to work. When we ask how we can help, a volunteer at the Comedor explains, we need more shoes and backpacks. In the fifth floor apartment that serves as a migrant woman and children's shelter in Nogales, Sonora, an 18 year old girl who wants to see her father, a woman from Central America who left under death threat, a mother who fled an abusive relationship and now needs to make more money to support her children and grandchildren, and an 80-year-old who wants to cross into Nogales, Arizona for the eighth time so she can sell paletas from a pushcart. A nun prods them into telling their stories to us, four women and one man visiting from a creative writing program at a state university just an hour north of them. The eldest woman stands, raising her hand as if testifying or praying. She says, when the first President Bush came into office, he tried to make life hard for migrants, but we rose up, she explains, and stopped him. She says as soon as she can, she will go back to the popsicle factory, to her boss. She tells us her boss's name and address, says her boss will give her a card to help her stay as soon as she can get back. And the woman who fled her country under death threat says, we want peace. Decades of US policies and interventions in Central America that favor business interests over the majority of the population, that export gang members and failed anti-gang policies must feel like a long, dirty war. Do you feel better when you tell these stories? One of us asks. And the woman does not answer, just keeps telling her story. We are teaching them to make earrings. The nun explains as she brings us into another room and shows us beaded jewelry. Row upon row, each piece a little memorial to every woman who has come through the shelter. What did the nun tell them about our presence or what we might be able to do for them? Were they told we could help? Were they told we could help before the end of their two-week stay at the women's shelter after which they would have to find their way north or back from where they came? Were they told some faulty equation of voice and change, some scrawl of hope like the flight of sparrows stalling and diving without knowing whose house they alight upon? What did we think we could do? Every summer for the past three, I've gone to Nogales, Mexico with students from the University of Arizona. And each summer, we bear witness to conditions migrants face, and we wonder, how can we amplify voices without turning other people's stories into commodities, without reaffirming a faulty myth of giving voice? We do not want to reduce the struggles of the migrants we meet to mere human interest stories. We know that writing will never be enough. 
The change necessary to improve the migrant women's lives feels utterly available and beyond any single transaction. We will work hard, the women tell us. Do you have bracelets? We eventually ask. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's such an honor to hear you read and an honor to work on this book, and I'm so glad that you could share it with us tonight. Thank you. Um, I, there's so much love in this chat for you right now. I hope you'll go back and read it after the event. Um, and now I'm excited to announce Joanna Williams, the Director of Advocacy and Education at Kino Border Initiative. Um, the Kino Border Initiative is a bi-national organization that works in the area of migration and is located in Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. Its mission is to promote the U.S.-Mexico border and immigration policies that affirm the dignity of the human person and a spirit of bi-national solidarity through direct humanitarian assistance and accompaniment with migrants, social and pastoral education in communities on both sides of the border, and participation in collaborative networks that engage in research and advocacy to transform local, regional, and national immigration policies. I'm really, really excited to hear what Joanna has to say. And again, if you'd like to learn more about the Kino Border Initiative, please visit kinoborderinitiative.org. And I'll hand it over to you, Joanna. Thank you so much for, well, Susan, for, for your beautiful writing, for the invitation to be here today. Um, I was just reflecting as, as you were reading that we at the Kino Border Initiative in so many ways were just reacting to what happens on a given day. Um, you know, who, who are the people that walked up to me and, and asked me a question this morning in, in Nogales? Um, and it's beautiful to get this opportunity to, to reflect more deeply and I think your, your writing in your book invites us into that. Um, and I'll, I'll add a quick parenthesis and say that we've already shared the excerpt that's available on the website widely because we've done these virtual immersions. We, we do educational programming at Kino Border Initiative, but since groups haven't been able to visit physically, we've been turning that all into virtual immersions. And the only blessing of the pandemic has been that the oper Operation Streamline has been canceled since March of this year. Uh, so we have used that excerpt or suggested that excerpt to people to read as a way for them to enter into the the spirit and the emotion of the courthouse even when the court itself is not happening um so there's lots of lots and lots of ties that <laughs> that i could dive into um between the what susan's written and, and our experience in at the kino border initiative um but that's not actually what she asked me to come and talk about um so so i will briefly uh, just share a little bit about what we're seeing in this moment in Nogales. Um, so in the the book is from the, a couple of visits, I believe, to, to Nogales, including in 2017. Um, and 2017 feels like ancient history <laughs> to us uh, at the border. Uh, you know, at the time we were seeing mostly people who'd been deported from the U.S., either having lived there or having crossed the border. That's still a reality that we're um, seeing and experiencing in, in these transnational lives of people who are divided by a border. Um, just a few days ago, we had a, an older, I, I, I wouldn't say older, but middle-aged man from El Salvador arrived to our aid center who had lived 30 years in the United States and had been deported last year back to El Salvador and now is making his way north trying to, to rejoin his family, his sisters live in Los Angeles um, and he recognizes the impossibility of that in the midst of all of these policies that have made it harder and harder to cross the border that have uh, pushed people to their deaths in the Arizona desert uh, and yet he says well my life is in the U.S. 30 years is my life um, and so he's in Nogales trying to think about what to do next. Um, so we still continue to receive the people in that situation, people who have been deported and who are uh, separated by borders, but more and more in recent years uh, and, and, and many the last several months, uh, the day-to-day -day reality has been that of people who have fled violence in Central America or Mexico, uh, even now Cuba and Venezuela, who are stranded at the border. Um, you know, one of the reasons that 2017 feels like distant history is that if, if an asylum seeker arrived at the border at that time, so the like the woman that, that Susan met in our women's shelter, 
decided to seek asylum, they could arrive to the port of entry and say, I'm seeking asylum, and in that moment be processed for their asylum claim uh, and start at least the immigration court process in the United States. And in the years since, the uh, administration has implemented a number of policies uh, whose main goal, I would say, uh, is to make people suffer as much as possible in order to discourage them from the system and to invisibilize the, the realities of asylum seekers so that the American public uh, doesn't see and doesn't hear from them. Uh, that's That has been a main strategy, especially since there was so much outrage in 2018 about the family separation policies. Uh, the administration got smarter and said, well, if we just delay people in Mexico, if we just send people back to Mexico to wait for their U.S. court dates, uh, then the U.S. public won't realize how complicit they are uh, in this suffering. Um, so that's the this place that we're in right now that's been capped now with the pandemic um, and the using the pandemic as a pretext to close the border. Uh, saying that the border is closed to non-essential travel as if fleeing for one's life wasn't the most essential <laughs> of travel that one needs to undertake. Um, so he, currently in, in Nogales we have um, women like a woman that I was speaking with this morning who arrived in Nogales in, no, in November of last year of 2019. She had fled from her community in Guerrero, Mexico, uh, which unfortunately is a part of Mexico that has a number of different criminal organizations that are fighting for territory and has become less and less safe in recent years and months. And so she fled with her children. She arrived to Nogales. She got on this list to try to seek asylum in the United States. Uh, in, and on March 20th of 2020, she was two families away from being the next family to present at the port of entry and seek asylum in the US. Uh, and that night was the night that the U.S. closed their border uh, and said we will no longer process any asylum seekers uh, and that was almost five months ago now uh, so she since then the situation for her family in Guerrero has, has become worse um, she's had additional family members killed and and additional family members flee and, and join her in Nogales trying to seek safety or, or at least become get closer to safety um, through that journey we also have women in Nogales, um, like a woman from Venezuela who uh, had sought asylum, was able to start the process, but then was sent back uh, to Nogales to wait for court dates in El Paso uh, under what's called the Migration Migrant Protection Protocols, which is the deepest irony of names, um, the most cynical of names that one could think of for this policy. Um, but now her court dates have been rescheduled and pushed back months and months and months uh, and she said, I just don't know what to do with my kids. I don't know what to tell my daughter uh, about why we're here in this limbo that we're in. Uh, and I can tell that she's upset, but I don't know how, I don't know how to support her. Um, so that's the, the situation right now of the people who are stranded, stranded is the best word that I can think of, uh, asylum seekers who are stranded by the fact that the US government has chosen to no longer recognize asylum. Uh, and in the face of that, we wonder, we also grapple this, with this question that Susan grapples with in her book of what does it mean to bear witness? What does it mean to amplify voices? Uh, and we don't have a perfect uh, answer to that. Um, I think I was also struck by another quote in the book of, uh, there may be no new atrocities, only the imperative to make them newly felt. Uh, and so we recognize that what's happening right now is new in some ways, but mostly it's old. <laughs> mostly it's based on uh, the, the traditions of racism, the traditions of exclusion that uh, underpin us uh, for many centuries. And yet, how can we make them newly felt? Um, and so today is a, is a special day for this book launch in part because it's a special day for us in, in Nogales. Um, so we've been grappling with this question and we've had asylum seekers like this woman from Venezuela and the woman that I mentioned from Guerrero who have said, well, what are you going to do? We, we, we're not being heard. We're just sitting around. This limbo is getting longer and longer. Uh, nobody cares about what's happening. What are we going to do? And, and, and with their, that push, that constant push from people that I was hearing, we said, well, we have to do something. <laughs> we have to plan some event. And so this morning we had a protest uh, at the border wall. We had people on the U.S. side of the border um, 
and for the asylum seekers on the Mexican side of the border, and several who read testimonies, um, many who read not their own testimony, but testimony of another person, which is a really beautiful opportunity for a Cuban to read a Mexican's testimony and a, and a Venezuelan to read a Nicaraguan one, and really this sign of solidarity amongst those who were in Nogales. And then those on the United States side, recognizing their complicity and, and saying, well, what the government won't do, we as civil society are acknowledging and validating the validity of your claims. Um, so coming off of that event this morning, um, I think I'm coming with a new energy at this question of what does it look like to bear witness and amplify voices, uh, that it's not it's not just being paralyzed by the, the question, but also saying, also listening to folks' invitations to act and say, well, at the very least, what we can do is give a give a platform, <laughs> and here's a microphone. And uh, you know, we thought the event was going to last 45 minutes, um, and people were still there two and a half hours later, <laughs> because so many people wanted to then just stand up and talk at the microphone that weren't on the schedule. They were we we hadn't <laughs> translated it or or, pre or prepped them. Uh, they just wanted to to be heard um, and to see that folks stayed and they listened. Um, and so at the very least, how can we hand over microphones um, and create platforms? Uh, that's that's the work of education and advocacy that we hope to do at the Kino Border Initiative, just in to be faithful to the people that we uh, encounter and work with in Nogales. Um, and that's a work that I'm grateful to be in alliance with, with the um, authors who are here and, and elsewhere. Uh, because it's, uh, as I said, it's this opportunity to be reflective and reactive all at once. Um, so thank you again, congratulations again, uh, and I just really appreciate your attention to, to what's happening in Nogales and the work of the Quinoa Border Initiative. Wow, thank you, Joanna. Wow. I am uh, incredibly energized uh, after that talk. Thank you for all of your hard work and your dedication. Um, and for being here tonight to share a little bit about that. Um, Susan has spoken very highly of you, so I'm glad that you could join us here tonight. Um, are you up for a few questions, Susan? Yeah, and I hope my, my other panelists um, are, are up as well. <laughs> yeah, and as a reminder to anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them um, in the chat, and I will we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, Several people in the chat have brought up, and I think it's something you just mentioned several times, Joanna, the tension in telling a story or giving voice and resisting commodification as a, as a human interest story. Um, how do you feel like that has changed since March? Do you feel like that, that tension is, is more fraught? Uh, are you approaching the question differently? Um, yeah, I would just like to hear more about that. And th that's for any of the... Uh, any of the readers, but Susan, I, I know you talk about explicitly in your book. Um, and has that changed since March because of the, the effects of the pandemic? If that's the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think what's interesting is is to note that there's different. I, I mean, I just want to say thank you again, Joanna, for for the work that you do and the work that you do in witnessing what's happening in the border and and giving. Not, not just witnessing, right? But as you said, passing the microphone off to people, it, it, because it feels like there's different urgencies and different ways in which, um, in which, as writers and those of us who care about these kinds of issues, want to to situate ourselves. Like, we just need at this point, uh, you know, we just for some issues we just need information. Like the last time I've been on the. Nogales border, um, which was last summer, I, I remember, and it, it does make it its way into the book, that that contrast between the first time I went in 2017 and the last time in 2019, when the first time I'd went, it was mostly single men in the Comedor who were sort of on their journey or just been deported. And when I was with you all last year, it was um, families who were in Nogales waiting to petition for asylum. It was when there were those long lines in front of the border, uh, right at the crossing, and then, then, then people stuck. And, and the whole atmosphere of the Comedor had changed, right? It had gone from these, um, this video of people um, from the Mexican Human Rights Commission laying out 
basic human right to um, sing-alongs with the nuns, right? Because there are so many children in the in the comedor. So there is a point at which we need that knowledge is important if we want to be able to reflect and to be understand our own places of um, complicity and connection. Um, but it but as writers, I think so. so I, like I, like I appreciate the work. There are so many journalists who are working on the border. Um, there are so many organizations like yours, Joanna, that are that are working, like you know, Border Initiative, um, and and trying to amplify those stories, which is important. And then for those of us who are engaging with them, it does take that that moment of. I think for me, what allowed me to feel as comfortable as I could be in handling a story that wasn't mine was to try to make very clear the ways in which it wasn't mine. And I think sometimes um, we often want to collapse distance in order to um, empathize or respect someone uh, with some, or to empathize with someone or to show respect to them. We say like, oh, that, you know, that's just like when my grandmother great grandmother immigrate immig- was an immigrant right or immigrated and it's just not so so how can we be sure to not in a in what is a gesture of solidarity collapse all those ways that there are difference and some of it is holding holding space for um for people to tell their own stories holding space for what we might not understand about other people's stories um and and using compassion For sure. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that? I'll just briefly add on the question of the, um, you know, how has that changed since March? There's so many disadvantages to this virtual world. (laughs) Um, And yet, and yet there are some ways that it collapses different distance in a different way than what, what Susan was mentioning, but it kind of has opened our mind as well to think or an, an imagination of how can we put people into conversation who are being very deliberately kept apart physically. Um, so why don't we have migrants in Mexico testifying at congressional briefings in the U.S.? Um, you know, there was never virtual congressional be- briefings in the past. And so it's allowed us to ask those kinds of questions. And I will be the first to admit that we at the Kino Board Initiative are not very strong on our video technology and Facebook Live and, and all of that. I've, I haven't actually watched the Facebook Live of this morning's protest. I hope that it's uh, of acceptable quality. But just having that opportunity and recognizing that there are people who aren't able to travel to Mexico or many people that we wouldn't reach if they had to, to travel to Nogales. Uh, and folks in Nogales find it very important to know that their voices are still reach are reaching further than they might otherwise because of this virtual world. So I think in the midst of all of the increased precarity and suffering, there's also this increased opportunity for encounter. For sure, and that's how we're all able to be together tonight as well. Um, Susan and Anthony, um, a few people in the chat would love to hear you talk about the visual and the textual. Um, Obviously, both of your work uh, is meant to be engaged with visually as well. So yeah, anything you'd like to say about that? Um, I can start, Susan. Um, For me, in in working through and sifting through the archive and the histories um, and working through kind of my own aesthetic and looking at the pages sort of a borderless moment to try to push push out beyond uh, the construct of like what is margin, what isn't in the margin, and trying to kind of bring that all back in to the page, and kind of both and exploring the page at the same time is sort of how I work, how I've worked through this collection, and kind of that own sifting, and kind of inviting others to help along in that sifting, and that's kind of how I, how I kind of explored that and looked through that lens when I was working on this collection. Yeah, I, I mean, I just to, I think both Anthony and Joanna point to the ways in which the documents themselves have all of these. There's so much that's left out, especially of official documents, especially when we're talking about um, 
you know, treaties, trade agreements, the government, the government documents of the state, documents of a state that has these this legacy of um, of racism and genocide. So, it was um, it was important for me to show the limits of the documents by by allowing the reader to actually see some of the documents within the book itself. And and so from the beginning, I had always wanted the images to be there. And again, I'm, I'm very grateful to the folks at Noemi and Doug Kearney for being able to really incorporate them in, in ways that I think were meaningful for the text. Because like to, even to get back to that first question, you know, we the documents, there's a great line um, from the poet Brandon Shimoda, who also writes about the Operation Streamline hearing, um, and he says, in a space designed to bleed people of their stories, it's easy for the imagination to go dark and stay dark. And I think um, that's also part of that issue with dealing with these stories, to, to know that the documents are not going to tell us everything. It wants us to not see these people, wants them to not see them as people. I'm sure if folks were following the... Um, the really infuriating raids of the No More Deaths aid camp that happened here in um, outside near Tucson. There, I think a document was being circulated on social media today that lists what was um, captured in the raid, and the last thing was like persons, but they're in this list of objects. So there's all these ways in which documents themselves turn people into something less than people, and so. I think to show the documents in a visual space like reminds us of the materiality of the archive and the limits of the documents. And then to go back to that first question, we also have to realize when telling someone else's story, there is that potential to turn them into another partial. So to always be gesturing to even our own stories as documents and what, what is inevitably left out of them. For sure. Um, someone asked if, Susan, if you could talk more about the further study. Oh, uh, there are sections just to show those folks who haven't necessarily seen the book. And it kind of grows out of the same thing that we were, that I was just talking about. There's, um, I don't know if that is, is legible, but there are sections. At the end of each chapter of the book, I've included some questions. Um, and they they are there's um they're a little bit tongue in cheek but they're they're also there i mean they're a little tongue in cheek because they i come out of a creative writing program and i'm one of those teachers that everyone hates who makes you do writing prompts in class um i'll check the comments later and see who agrees but um but i but again like to go back to that idea of this this is also a document which has its own um its own limits I wanted people to feel like this book itself um, was offered places where one could react to it. So, um, so while some folks might read them as tongue in cheek, I also would really love it if people were sort of responding and reflecting and writing into this book because it's a snippet and it's as as John is saying, it's a partial history that's changing very quickly on the border too. And I think just, just creating spaces for that history to be amended and for, for those readers to sort of think about their relationship to that history. Um, we have a question for Christina and Susan. Um, someone would want to know your thoughts on the book as an architecture to protect the object. Could you repeat that question again? Yeah, the book as an architect uh, architecture to protect the object. I'm not quite sure, but I like where it's headed. <laughs> that that's uh, that's very interesting, in fact, and and I would I would relate that to something that Susan has just said. Uh, um, uh, what do we do with these stories that that are not necessarily mine, right? How do how do we protect that relationship? With the story, and I think when I when I was uh, going through the list of um, objects 
that uh, that my family have been talking about for a long time. These are not objects that I have actually seen. These are ob- objects that I've uh, that I've been hunting in uh, thrift stores and secondhand stores, wherever I can get hold of them, because I've heard stories about them. And uh, and at times I'm just trying to you know to look out and see. Uh, I that reminds me of something. That's something that I, that really brings my attention. And so I try to. What I did in this case was try to bring it in within a, a narrative that I have been constructing with documents indeed, but doing what, what Susan so eloquently uh, talks about in the book, uh, trying to unfinish that document, documents that appear to be complete, a unit in, in their own. And our gaze, I think, our reading process, our interpretation, uh, uh, are these little keys that open them up again. So they have to speak a different language and they have to tell another story. And and with with that reading and in connection with other uh, forms of research, interviews, just conversations, uh, uh, field research, going uh, to these places, I think there is, a, there is that need, the compassion that Susan was talking about earlier, the care, uh, uh, that tentative approach, that getting closer with a lot of care, I think that's true for stories and it's true for uh, objects always, always. It's true, of course, for writing. And I'm so grateful that Susan put that right there on the open in this book. And by the way, I would love for someone to translate this book immediately into Spanish. Let's see what we can do for that. Um, the architecture of the book as protective of objects. Um, it's interesting, right? Because the book is also about defacing certain objects. And um, so it's, it's, it's maybe if, if it works, if it works in, in a protective way, or maybe it offers the, um, maybe my hope is that it offers example of writers who have used um, writing to create these protective spaces around particular histories and moments. So I think about the, there's a, a Lely Long Soldier poem that I cite in the book um, in which she's dealing with a document that is the um, official apology of the United States towards the indigenous populations and she actually takes certain words, she reproduces a snippet of the apology and then um, not just erases, but takes certain words from that page and reproduces them on another page of her book. And the words are family and belief system and spirit. And um, so there is a potential for writing to have a kind of um, protective force and then there's also a limit to the things that writing can protect and there's um there's a there's an interesting tension that i think we as as writers have to to hold in our balance that um that that one thing too that this book um makes me think about is is the limits of of activism that's maybe on the page sure i think we have time for two more if that's okay um, the, someone would like you to talk about the journey of the title of your book, Susan. Um, you first used it in an essay about Rekaiser, and now it seems to literally describe the necessary destruction of monuments. Yeah, I mean, that was lucky, huh? I mean, <laughs> I mean it is lucky, but it's, it's just another, um, it's not lucky, it's, a, it's just the, the fact of um, we've lived in this history We've lived with this history for so long and surrounded by um, by monuments that necessarily, it, again, they're they're these sort of public documents that that are really great examples of how official histories don't tell complete stories. Um, you know, the 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 Ruckheiser. The title comes from an essay I wrote about Ruckheiser, some of which does make its way into the book, and it refers to a moment in her poem, The Book of the Dead, where she reprints a, a, a monument describing um, the site of John Brown's death and then writes inside it. Um, but even 
I mean, to really talk about the history, I think even before um, I thought about defacing a monument in terms of what Ruckheiser is doing, I um, I have a PhD, I have the strangest PhD, I have a PhD in English, but I studied ruins. Um, and I was, I was sort of thinking about the history of ruins as um, a kind of narrative that's being told in in U.S. or on U.S. landscapes, and so what are the things, what are the things that we often ruins represent the things we don't want to remember, and um, and in doing some of that research into memorial projects in the the U.S., I was um, interested, and I was at the time even teaching about the monuments monuments to Confederate generals that were uh, on the UT Austin campus where I was working. So I mean, I think for many of us, this. Um, the idea of defacing monuments has been, uh, we've heard stories about it and we've seen it and we've potentially participated in those kind of defacements throughout our lives. Um, I think there was a real movement when Brie Newsom climbed up on that, um, there was a real moment a few years ago when Brie Newsom climbed up on that flagpole in South Carolina and said in the name of God, I take this flag must come down today. And that, that, even though monuments are symbols, um, they have their power. They don't, bringing a monument down doesn't change everything, but it certainly has been, I think, inspiring for a lot of, of people. For sure. Um, someone in the chat says that they keep thinking about the idea that our capacity to witness has increased at a disproportionate rate in relation to our ability to affect change. Um, and I guess this is one that everyone can answer if they feel so called to. Um, how, how do you imagine us narrowing that gap the, the, from between the capacity to witness and the relation or ability to affect change? It's a tough one. I don't know if anyone has, has the answer well, there. I might, I might dispute the premise of the question <laughs> if that's <laughs> acceptable. Um, I think that when we use the word witness, it, witnesses are in the act of witnessing are, are changing. So seeing, like our, our capacity to see and know far exceeds our, our capacity to create change. But I would actually say that our capacity to witness and to change, should those, those two concepts go together um, and are in, inseparable. <laughs> so, so it's more a question of how do we how do we lean into the witnessing well and not just to let, allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the knowing and the seeing? Yeah, I, yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Joanna, um, in the sense of our, the, because of the, the stream of unceasing data that can just become a deluge, it becomes very simple to not only for, to sometimes forget you know, there are moments, even in this pandemic, where it's like, you know, so, so this event happened. When was that? That was like three years ago. No, that was six months ago. No, that was two. Wait, that was that was that was two weeks ago. And so, kind of as as kind of we write within the archive, as we kind of write out of the archive, and we're writing both in the moment or historical. That kind of is that part of that moment to kind of make sure it doesn't get buried in the. In the in the massive data that just overwhelms us now, it seems like. And I, I think there's a level in which um, we are seeing change. I, I mean, to go back to just this this idea of defacing the monuments, you know, to some of these these contested sites have been contested for years and years, and and. You know, in what our life looked like six months ago to what it is now, there have been unthinkable changes in both good and bad. And there, there is room, if we can't quite muster hope, like maybe we can at least muster that there's possibility, there continues to be possibility. And um, it, it is hard, but to be aware of um, the way that we are we have the ability and are being asked both to see so much and and at the same time to have so much be hidden from us, I think is 
is important to kind of to keep that awareness as we see so much and then there's so much that we don't see but to also um to remember that people people are reacting and people are reacting in ways that um that are beautiful in imagining new possibilities to that kind of witnessing it's true um but so I'll end on this last question. Um, everyone, I, I, you have to go back and read this chat, Susan. It's so great. Everyone is so inspired tonight. Um, but Joanna, they would like to know the best way to support uh, Kino Border Initiative's work. So I'd love if you would uh, tell us, yeah, where we should go, what we should do. Well, there's a few options. You can buy the book today, and then you give five dollars to KBI and fifty percent <laughs> of the proceeds. So uh, that would be the the action to take tonight. Um, the other, uh, we still need backpacks and shoes, just like uh, Susan mentioned, and that, that hasn't changed since 2017 to the present. Uh, I think more important, not more importantly, of equal importance um, is really to join us in this action, um, and it goes back to the last question of what is our capacity to change, and Susan's comment about what's our sense of possibility. Um, what's what we're asking you to do is to be persistent and persevere, just, just as persistent as the people here in Nogales in your advocacy. Um, and that means, yes, leveraging the political power that you have if you happen to live in the United States, um, or if you happen to live in Mexico, also leveraging your political power. I don't know if anyone's joining us from Mexico, but certainly the um, Mexican government has a strong role in this as well. Uh, so being persistent in that advocacy um, and we are providing a lot of opportunities to do that if you want to follow our Facebook page um, and specifically related to the Save Asylum campaign if you go to saveasylum.org we have a few invitations for action in a much more immediate sense of what can you do to combat the closure of the border to asylum seekers at this moment. Um, so in the spirit of the protests we had this morning you can go to saveasylum.org or the KBI Facebook page um, and take the, the three actions that we are suggesting there. Great, thank you. And I, in the email to Eventbrite attendees tomorrow, I can include all that information so that everyone has it in front of them. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Does anyone have any last words before we uh, depart for the evening? It feels like an evening among old friends in the chat. So lovely. I just want to give my thanks to all of you for coming again. It's such an honor and it's such a pleasure to to be with you tonight for this time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And it's been wonderful. And I, I really want everybody to read this book. Thank you for hosting this event, Mandy. Thanks, everyone, and you can catch us on the YouTube channel later if you came late or you just want to watch it again, and uh, we'll see you around. <laughs>